I'll help you out in a minute if you're well. Well, it is an honor and need to be here today, and um, I did grow up in the Parsonage. I lived there for four to six years, depending upon how you look at it. I, uh, went, I went to high school at Southern Huntington County High School. We moved here in 72. Uh, I was brought here because my dad came here. <laughs> at the time, I didn't know how much of my life would be connected to this community or to this church. But, over the next four years, as I went to school and graduated in 76, so the, yes, this is my 40th anniversary year of graduation. It's not only that, it's also this year, uh, 37 years ago, I stood right down here and waited for a young lady by the name of Veronica Devlin to walk down that aisle with her brother John and meet me at the altar. We've been married and have three children, five grandchildren, we're very proud of, and uh, they're a part of our family. I did not know that when we moved here. We moved here in the middle of the school year. Any of you ever moved in December? <laughs> Between Christmas and New Year's? I see a pastor's couple right here. Done it, been there, done that, right? That's when I moved there. <laughs> when you moved here. <laughs> Interestingly enough, as a child, or as a young person, because I was in 7th grade at the time, 8th grade, I guess, somewhere in there, uh, I wasn't necessarily thrilled to be here, because I wanted to be back where I was at, where I knew everybody. But I quickly came to know this as home. In fact, most people ask me, where is my home? And I say, well, it's probably Orbizonia, because I graduated from high school there, I met my wife there. You know, it was that t place where I threw that note across the seat on the bus to ask a young lady for a date. <coughs> she said yes. And uh, she's now, as you already know, my wife. Some of you remember the days of me walking in the back door and I'd ask my dad to use the vehicle and his first question was, anybody remember? Did you carry the firewood? <laughs> I couldn't have a car unless I carried the firewood. Uh, I borrowed the car to, to date. Um, those are all memories we have. And you know, it's great to have memories. Amen. In fact, 75 years of memories for this church. And it's been really interesting to hear Blair McKim share his remembrances from the very early ages of the church. And then Joel last night to, to share from his heart. And then for me to get a call from your pastor saying, Kent, would you consider? Mm -hmm. You know, as I was talking with Daryl a few minutes ago before the service began, I believe this is the first time I've ever preached here. Mm -hmm. I preached at, uh, I participated, maybe that's a better word, at a teen retreat down in East Waterford. As a kid, we used to go to Licking Creek <coughs> Scout Camp, and I remember those days very vividly. Jumping down through the hole in the roof, uh, in front of the fireplace, all those fun things we used to do. Many of you were adults who were there to supervise us, keep us out of trouble. And uh, today, we are here because this is what God has called us to do. You know, when I was a kid growing up here, I thought I was going to be a medical missionary. I went to school pre-med, I went to Eastern Nazarene College. During the years there, I began to take some business courses and I strayed for a while. I went into business and became a successful um, president of a company at 28 years of age and didn't know what I wanted to do the rest of my life. But you know, God's like the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. When he's on your trail, he always gets his man. The interesting thing was, the day I went home to tell my wife that I had come to the conclusion that God 
was calling me. In fact, one of my employees asked me, he said, Kent, you've always said our business is a ministry. But I have a question for you. Are you supposed to be in the ministry? That was 7.30 on Friday, March the 18th, 1988. Hmm. And as... In that moment, just as I am now, I teared up. And I said to Pete and to Roger, both of them good Christian men, I said, guys, I'll see you Monday. I'll give you my answer. I walked out. Now, jokingly that morning, I had said to my wife, I'm going to lose my job today. Half jokingly, because there were a lot of tensions in the corporate world that I was dealing with at that point in time. I came in the door with tears in my eyes, and I said to her, not expecting her to answer me at all the way she did. I said, Ronnie, and that's, by the way, her name's been changed to Ronnie. You all know her as Veronica. We all know her as Ronnie. It depends on where you live and when. But uh, I walked in the door and I said to her, I said, you know, I was joking that I was going to lose my job this morning. She said, yeah. I said, How, what would you feel like if, we, if I told you we were going to go in the pastor? She goes, well, I told God three years ago that if he was going to get you, he had to get it to you for himself. <laughs> you see, my wife had known for three years that God was working in my life. And so here I am today because of the fact that you all played a part in my life. This Praise church God. has played a part in my life. Praise God. In many ways, more than you'll ever know. From the love and support that you have given us over the years, sometimes from afar, sometimes up close. From the years that we spent going to school and learning in this community, and you know, some of those lessons that I learned way back in high school, believe it or not, I still use today. In fact, I wish Miss Regina Hicks was here because I would be able to tell her that what she told me back in speech class I still use almost every time I preach. And her instructions were to know your audience. And you see, I don't have to know this audience, but my Heavenly Father does. Amen. He knows each and every heart that's here today. And today I want to take a look at, in fact, Jeff, you talked about when the pastor knew what to preach. I have a new one for you. I knew within five minutes of when Daryl called. Amen. And that was several months ago. About three months ago, to be precise. Maybe a little bit. No, it was longer than that. It was earlier in a year than that because there was another event after that that we moved to date because of this. But I want to today look to the scriptures. And at the very first place that God took me was immediately to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. And I would encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me. And then also, while you're looking that up, would you take a moment and look up Hebrews 11? 8 through 13. I'm going to be using both these passages. For many of you, these will be familiar passages. There'll be places where you've been before, but maybe you haven't caught what I've been, what God's laid on my heart for today. And when you found it in the scripture, if you would stand with me as we read this together. Begin with Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, or Abram, excuse me, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarah, or Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had, and gathered, and gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to a place of Shechem, as far as the Trebenth tree of Moray. And the Canaanites were 
then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. And then if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. You'll notice that there's a name change here. Just as my wife had a name change, so too God changed the names of Abram to Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. May God add to our understanding of His Word this day as we look to these words. Let's bow our heads forward and pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, You have been at work preparing each one of us to hear from You today. Lord, uh, use these words from these lips of clay that, Lord, they will be words that will be heard for each heart as You would have it. Lord, we ask now that, Lord, we would understand better Your Word in the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How would you like to get a message, get out of your country? From your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. That's the message Abraham received. Now you have to remember, he received this, and then the scripture says in verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. He took off. But I want you to know, and this is what caught my eye in the passage, and Abram was 75 years old. Do you realize this is the only place in the Scripture that says anything about 75 years? Hmm. I remember that from many years ago when I read this story, and over the years I've read it again, and it has always stopped. Because you see, we live in a society where it talks about 75 years old is retirement age. 75 years, many people are getting the call to move to the assisted living. They're getting the call to move to the nursing home. They're getting the call to give up on life. Or to retire. That's a word that's actually not in the Bible either. Did you know that? Right. You see, I'm in a profession where you don't retire from it. You continue to do it. Amen. You don't have a choice because we're called. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And you have to understand something. Abram was not given an option at 75 because if you notice, the word was not, would you please? Maybe you ought to. Maybe you ought to think about this. No. It was a command. The language that God used was a command language. Right. It wasn't quit and give up. It was pick up and go. And what did Abram do? At 75 years of age, he picked up. Now, before any of you think you got it, oh, okay, 75 is wonderful and I'm all set because I'm 75 years old, let me help you with something. Ladies, how many of you reached 99 yet? <laughs> Guess what? There's still a possibility of a pregnancy out there for you. <laughs> Just ask Sarah, and she did exactly what you're all doing now. She laughed. Okay? But stop and think about that. You see, God's timing is not the same as our chronological clock. God's timing is that we are called 
at whatever age we are at. And we are called to do what He calls us to do. It doesn't matter when you start. It's the outcome. Because you have to remember, what did we read in Hebrews chapter 8? There's an outcome. We'll get to that here in a couple minutes. In fact, by faith, Abraham. And by faith, Sarah. And from this one man and this woman came what? A nation. A country through one child. You see, so often we get caught up in the fact that we have to have numbers and we have to have all this stuff in place. And you know what? The reality is God doesn't call us when we have everything in place. Kent Vanderford wasn't planning on that on March 18th, 1988 at 7.30 in the evening. That wasn't on his radar screen. He was planning to go on about his life. But what happened? God came along. He interrupted it. What did it mean? I had just bought a house 18 months before. We were paying it off. You know, stop and think about that. You buy a house in 18 months and now you've got to pay the debt off when you go to sell it? What in the world are we going to do? Well, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Our God blessed us. We actually made money on that house in 18 months. We moved to a place called Burnham, Pennsylvania. It's right down at Lewistown. We were there for nine and a half years. <clears throat> some of the best years of our lives and some of the worst years of our lives. But God was with us. God took us through. But what was it? We had to be willing. We had to go. We had to depart. We had to do what God called us Amen. to do. Amen. <coughs> Here's the point. God is still calling 75-year-olds and 75-year-old churches. This church didn't get to be 75 years old without someone who was called Reverend Huffman who came through a community and started a revival. He did that without anybody being here. Amen. Guess what? God's still in starting things with 75-year-olds. Amen. God's still in starting things with a 75-year-old church. Oh, well, wait a minute. Daryl and I were just talking a couple of minutes ago. And I, I've observed it every time recently when I've come back to town. The place isn't the same. I see houses that are in disrepair that used to have owners that kept it with pride. I worked at the East Broad Top Railroad for two summers, and you know, I was disappointed yesterday to see the weeds growing up through the tracks. I remember taking care of the steam locomotive engine. I remember crawling into it and rebuilding it, retubing it. Not a whole lot of people my age that can say that, but I have that experience because I lived here. I remember going over those summers to Robertsdale and replacing the water line because the East Broadtop owned the water company up there. I remember those days well. I remember coming home and my mom scrubbing me. She's sitting back there laughing because I was covered black from getting out of the engine when I would be up in the engine covered with soot. She wouldn't let me in the house. So my first bath started right out here in the parking lot. You guys didn't know you had an outdoor bathroom here, did you? But I knew it. Mom was there with her scrub brush and the soap, and she would go after me. Because otherwise, I left a real nice ring in the tub. I did anyway after that was done, still. But the whole point is, is what? Jesus is still calling 75-year-old churches and people. He's calling people of every age yes. to be willing Amen. to serve, yes. to do, to come and do what He wants us to do. But how does that happen? It doesn't happen without, first of all, us stepping out into the unknown. What's the unknown? We've kind of talked about it a little bit here today. We live, I mean, how many conversations have you all had that started something like this? It's never been like this before. 
Think about that. How many of us do a little bit of pining like I just did for things of the past? You know, I, I drive into town and the post office isn't where it used to be. I drive into town and the IGA is gone. There's a parking lot there instead. I drive into town and Junior's not in his garage. <laughs> we talked about that last night. But what is it? We're in a transition, a change of time. But you know what? God is in the midst of that. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? He doesn't give us a pass. <clears throat> he doesn't say, okay, well, too bad. Life's over. Just because all the kids are not long, no longer going to school and all the rest of those things, you get to stop. Instead, He calls us into the unknown. And he says, trust me, even when we don't know who, what, when, how, or that other question that we always ask, why? How many of you have small grandchildren or small children in your life? You get tired of that question, why? Mm -hmm. Come on, Pop, why? My grandchildren do it to me. Why? Why? You know what? God does not get tired of us asking the why question. What he does get tired of is when we don't obey him. Amen. That's the difference. That's the significant difference. Our God wants us to do what? He wants us to respond. He wants us to go. He wants us to do. And he's not afraid to answer those questions. But sometimes, just as my parents used to do to me, because I said so. <laughs> Amen. Because I said so. You're just going to have to trust me in this. You're just going to have to recognize that I have your best interest at heart. Uh -huh. God has the best interest of a 75-year-old church in Rock Hill, Pennsylvania that's called the Orbizonia Church <laughs> at heart. Right? Amen. And guess what? He has your best interest at heart. Right. So whether that is dealing with your kids or your grandkids, or maybe that's dealing with the neighbors. Maybe it's finding a new ministry opportunity that you never thought you could ever have. Maybe it's suddenly being called later in life, as my wife has been. She's in the course of study. She's four classes short of finishing. She'll be graduating soon. And then on toward ordination. Why is that so important? Because God has called and she has said yes. Amen. You see, she didn't, we didn't ask why. I remember the evening we had that conversation and I think she was expecting me to say, no, you're not, you shouldn't be doing that. But no, it's not even an option. When God calls us, it's not a question of the who, what, when, where, or why, or how. It's a question of, do I trust Him enough that He will take us where He wants us to go? Amen. Amen. requires a walk in faith. You see, Abraham and Sarah are in the Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame. That's what I call chapter 11 of Hebrews, the Faith Hall of Fame. They're there because they were faithful. That was their hallmark. They were willing to trust, even when it required something beyond themselves, something that required a belief. Abraham didn't know what was in Cana. But he went. Sarah laughed like you all did earlier when I mentioned that she was 99 years when she had her first and only child. The whole point of that I believe God put in the Bible is so that we understand that, look, chronological time does not matter to God. Amen. Right, right. Our age does not matter to God. God will do with us what He wants to do. Amen. If we are willing to let Him. That's right. And we are willing to do what He calls us to do. Mm -hmm. Now for those young people here. Look at this as a Jesus adventure. We live in a world of everybody wanting an extreme something, right? Extreme sports. You have extreme fitness over here in town, right? Guess what? We have a world that's full of people who want extreme something. 
But I want to share with you just a few highlights from our Bible. These are people who were extreme adventurers. How many of you ever remember the name Joshua? And what did Joshua say to his people? As for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. As for me and my house, you have a choice, but as for me and my house. And that was before he did what? Guess what the first test he faced was? Any of you been to Jericho? Yeah. Have you walked around the wall seven times? Oh, and seven times more on the Sabbath? And watched him crumble? You have to remember, Joshua had been there before as a spy. He had seen the land of opportunity. But I don't think that when he was saying, as for me and in my house, we will serve the Lord, he was necessarily thinking the first thing he was going to tackle was Jericho. Let's stop and think about that. Now, maybe you say, well, okay, that's Joshua. Well, how many of you have ever been on a threshing floor? I've been to the Petersons and bailed hay more than once, and at, the, at uh, Clarence Kramer's and bailed hay more than once over the years of my life, and other places. Why? Okay, so think about this. Here's Gideon. He just mind his own business. Trying not to be caught. Threshing away. Trying to make what he needed for food for his family and get it put away before someone came along and swiped it. And here comes God. And God says to Gideon, I want you to raise up an army. Now Gideon is a simple farmer. He says, what in the world do I know about military tactics? And he puts God to the test. Many of us have done what Gideon has done. We put those fleeces out. We said to God, are you really asking me to do that? Really? Come on, God. Are you sure? Really? And God's response to Gideon each time was, yes, I'm sure. I'm calling you. But wait a minute. I'm not trained for that. How many of you have ever been asked to do something you weren't trained for? Guess what? God calls us for things we're not trained for. Mm -hmm. He calls us for things that we are least expecting. Mm -hmm. Think about it. He called 12 disciples. A third of them were fishermen. They weren't trained to be fishers of men. But you see, God can prepare us to be what He calls us to be. Mm -hmm. He did Gideon. And what did Gideon have to do? Now think about this. Gideon thought he had an army of 10,000 men. He was still outnumbered, but he thought he had an army of 10,000 men. And what's the first thing God does? Send them home. That's right. Send them home. Mm -hmm. Narrowed it down to 300. Mm -hmm. Now think about the odds. <laughs> and yet, when God is in, when God is in, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter about the odds. That's right. When God's in it, it doesn't matter about the others. That's an extreme adventure. <laughs> now let's talk about David. All of us know the story of David. And I love two things about that story. The first one is David's willingness to do whatever God wanted him to do. But the second one is the one that always gets my attention. Saul offered to David his armor. It'd be kind of like my dad offering me his suspenders. <laughs> they just don't quite fit. <laughs> They're just not me. I'm not a suspenders kind of guy. But you have to understand something. David didn't accept Saul's armor either. Instead, what did he do? He picked up those five smooth stones. Those familiar things that God had already showed him how to use. And he beat Goliath. But do you think David was wondering at the beginning, wow, this is going to be a pretty extreme adventure. I don't think that thought ever went through David's mind. It was, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. But think about it. Isn't that an extreme adventure? 
Then you, can you imagine being Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How many of you have ever felt like you've been in the middle of the fire? I've been there a few times. In fact, I spent many a day in the firebox. Realizing it was four by eight by eight. It's actually four foot high by four foot high and then eight foot long. That's the room you have. You crawl through a tube, it's just barely big enough for you to slide through. Talk about claustrophobia. But if you think about it, into the fire is where God took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But he didn't leave them there by himself. What was the witness that day? There's not one. There's not two. There's not three. But there's how many there? Four. That's right. There were four seen in that fire because you see, our God does not let you in the fire by yourself. Amen. When you're serving Amen. Him. And when you're following Him and when you're on extreme adventure. Then have you ever thought about an uncomfortable night? How many of you have ever, ever slept uncomfortably? <laughs> Did you ever think about sleeping with lions? <laughs> you know, I've seen those pictures where they stick their head. I actually, I've seen those actors and whatnot at the, fa at the fair and those places. You know, those people are willing to stick their head in the mouth of just about anything. I think that Daniel slept with his head in the mouth of a lion. <laughs> You talk about being uncomfortable. Yet he slept like a baby. Because our God was there with him. Amen. You see, that's extreme. That's an extreme adventure on steroids with God. Then there are 12 apostles. Now think about this. Jesus is gone. He's left everything behind to them. And there's only 12 of them. They're responsible for this crucible that becomes the church. Hmm. They're the people who begin to tell the story. And the story they have to tell is more powerful than any other story in all the world. Amen. Because there are men who the scripture tells us, and this is the exact quote, these were men who spent time with Jesus. That's the only thing they could find about them. They set them apart and made them different. You see, when Peter preached on Pentecost Sunday, and they were brought in before the religious leaders, they did an evaluation, they were ready to, to do something to them, and the only thing they could find is these were men who spent time with Jesus. You see, if we spend time with Jesus, our age won't matter, the 75 years won't matter, and you will be on an adventure, an extreme adventure. Just ask Paul. Yeah. <laughs> you see, Paul is a very good example for the rest of us. You think you've got to worry about how you get from point A to point B? God provides. Mm -hmm. It's called the Roman prison system. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us don't think about that. Mm -hmm. But that's how Paul moved from point to point to point right. along his ministry. Some of us think prison's a place to fear. But for Paul, it was a method to do what God called him to do. Uh -huh. And he spent that time writing the letters that, you know what, we still use to this day. Uh -huh. That's an extreme adventure on steroids, don't you think? <laughs> you see, God's still calling us to extreme adventures on steroids. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter your age. How do we know? Think about Timothy. Paul wrote to Timothy. What did he tell him? Don't worry about your age. But I want to say something to you the other side of it. Don't worry about your age at 75 either. It doesn't matter. You see, this church is 75 years old, but what does God have for it out into eternity? You see, we want to sit here and go, oh, well, you know, all these 
reasons. And you know, I deal with it as well. Yes, I'm a part of a big church. I'm on staff there. I have responsibilities. We're struggling at times. That sounds weird to say, but we are. But what does that mean? It means, you know what? God is getting ready to do something. God's getting ready to do something, guys. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to stand here and predict to you that He's coming back today, tomorrow, or five years from now because I used to sit in some of these pews and I remember being told He was coming in 1984 and then He was coming in, in whatever age. And you know what? None of those proved out to be true. So God is still coming when God chooses to come. Amen. Amen. But in the meantime, He says to us, get involved. Become extremely involved. Get involved in this adventure. You know, I think of uh, Blair as he preached on Friday night, and I was not here, but I heard it through the web. And thank you for the, putting that up. That's one of the ways today we impact people we don't even begin to know is through the web. Amen. And Blair was talking about his theme. Where he leads, I will follow. Where he leads, I will follow. You see, Blair and I didn't compare notes. But our Heavenly Father was preparing this church for this weekend. Mm -hmm. Joel and I didn't compare notes. But Joel last night preached about celebrating what? The lost. How much we need to go out and seek the lost. You see, the lost ain't in here, guys. The biggest misnomer we have in the church today is that, that the lost are here. We have an extreme responsibility for those that are out there. Yes. And you see, when I point my fingers like this, look what's pointing back at me. And that was taught to me here. There's three fingers pointing back to me in each hand. So guess what? I have three times the responsibility that the rest of you do. But when you point your fingers, guess what you have? You see, God doesn't give us a, a Sunday off, a day off, he says, take your story. Just as He gave the disciples a story, He has given us a story. Your Jesus story. What has Jesus done in your life? What has He done in the life of this church? Yes. We've been looking to the past. But you see, my responsibility, based on what I believe what God called me to do, is to tell you to look to the future. We have a responsibility for something that's out there that we don't even begin to know about. We have to step into the unknown. We have to trust Him and we have to walk by faith to do it. Amen. So where's God leading you? In the words of Blair McKim. Where's God leading you? You see, it starts with the individual. Because you see, the church is a group of individuals brought together to become the body of Jesus Christ. So where's God leading you? Well, he's led Jeff Peterson back to Orbazoni for some reason. I don't know what he's doing in the midst of all that. I don't know what that all means. But where's he leading you? And then are you following? Well, I'm too old. No, you're not. Amen. I don't know anybody. Yes, you do. When you go to the cash register at the local store, you talk to the cashier, don't you? You know somebody. You go to the doctor's office. You talk to the nurse. You talk to the receptionist. You know somebody. Right? You see, we can't get away with a pass. God doesn't issue passes. God says, here I am. Follow me. Amen. Go where I've led you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Take me with you. Amen. Amen. Trust mm -hmm. in me. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I will be faithful. Mm -hmm. yes. You have to remember, when we get to heaven, our diploma is this. Well done, thou good and what? Faithful yes. servant. Yes. You see, God's exam for us is not what, did, what do you have in your hand? 
It's not what did you leave behind. It's what did you do when I called you to do something. Mm -hmm. Were you faithful? next question is, where is God leading the Orbizonia Church of the Nazarene? And I'm not here to be a prophet. I'm not here to tell you I know it, and here's the answer. But here's the deal. You need to seek God's face. Amen. Individually first. Collectively as a body. Mm -hmm. What is it that God wants us to do? Mm -hmm. What is it that He wants from the Orbizonia Church of the Nazarene? How does He want us to impact the world? What extreme adventure does He want us to go on together? What difference does He want us to make? In Rock Hill? In Orbizonia? In Southern Huntington County? In Huntington County? In the state of Pennsylvania? in the United States of America, in the world. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Many of you, this church has had an impact out into the world. Amen. Over the years. Right? Sure. Church in Cuba. Mm -hmm. That's a place that was thought impossible. Mm -hmm. Yet what did God do? God opened the door of opportunity. Extreme adventure. What's God going to do with the Orbizonia Church of the Nazarene in the next 75 years? And now I probably won't be here for the 150th anniversary celebration. That's probably real. But God can do whatever He wants. Amen. So I may be here. But here's the reality. Joel was talking about 25 years last night. The reality is, God wants us to do and be faithful, no matter what that time frame is. That's right. <clears throat> I was thinking all for several months now and dwelling on this, and I really did not have a closing until I heard Blair's message. And I would like you to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 99. <coughs> And I want to ask you a simple question before we even begin to sing this or if Jackie even begins to play it. What is God leading you to do? What is God asking you to do? <coughs> What's the extreme thing that God's got planned for you? Are you ready to join Joshua and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This song is a song that tells us how faithful God is when He leads us. It's a song that we sing pretty glibly sometimes without thinking about what it really, really means. But ask the folks in China or Syria, or some of those places around the world, what the cost has been for them to know the gospel. Ask these men and women that I listed their names. And you know what? Ask some of the people who were here when this church was first founded what the cost was. We have a list of names of the pastors who've been here over the years, but you know what we don't have? We don't have a list of the names of all the people. Amen. All the congregants. We pastors get a nice pat on the back, but the reality is there's a whole host of congregants who come Amen. through here and gone. Right. Some of them are in heaven already. God. Some of them are young people who went through here and heard the gospel and went out and did other things that Joel talked about last night. But still others. God's still talking. God's still talking. God still wants you. You know, I remember that poster that says Uncle Sam? Yeah. 
Want you? Well, I've got another poster. <laughs> My God is not never stop the recruiting business. And you are on his recruiting list. And he wants you. He wants you. Are you willing to go where he leads you? Are you willing to follow? Maybe there's been a lot of time and travel that's happened. And maybe there's things that you've left slide by. And that's okay. Because God's still saying, come. He still leads us. And today, yes, we're at 75 years. I heard someone say 75 years and counting this morning. And I think it was Billy Hammond when he was praying. And you know what? That's exactly right. He's not done with the Order Zone Church of Nazareth. And he's not done with any of us sitting here this morning. Amen. He's only Amen. but just begun. Amen. 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 Let's sing this song together. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort. Thank you.